Valeu. Yes, good morning, everybody, and welcome to um, um, this uh, edition of um, FTA's Brexit latest uh, developments uh, webinar. Um, many of you may be familiar with this, but this is our uh, regular uh, briefing for members in terms of where we are with Brexit, what FTA is doing on your behalf, and uh, what is coming up um, in, in, in the future. So my name's Chris Welsh. I'm uh, FTA's Director of uh, Global and European Policy. So I'll be chairing this webinar, updating you on um, uh, certain aspects of um, the uh, uh, the agenda for today. Um, and I'm joined by um, uh, Pauline Bastidon, who is um, FTA's um, Head of European Policy based in our Brussels office and um, is, is our uh, principal link um, and coordinator of um, FTA's Brussels uh, activities and, and uh, with regard to uh, uh, Brexit. So a few um, house rules, if you like, for um, the seminar, which will hopefully make it smoother for everybody. And that is, could I ask all um, atten uh, at attendees to the webinar to ensure that the microphone and telephone um, is muted? As as in previous webinars, the webinar will be recorded, um, so you'll be able to download it and access it from the the, um, uh, the website. Um, uh, we won't be, be able to do with all technical matters um, in this webinar, which is giving um, an overview. Um, but if you um, if you've got a question, um, um, put it um, in the box, and if there's time, we'll endeavour to um, to cover that off. If not, um, then we will be providing answers and publishing those answers on the website as in previous um, uh, web webinars. So, um, uh, so that's the general framework for the um, for the webinar. Um, so I uh, immediately like to go into the first point, and that is to update you on the current status um, uh, and the upcoming uh, EU uh, Council Summit, um, which will be setting the guidelines for the future relationship. So I'd like to pass you over to Pauline Bastidon to, to cover that off. Over to you, Pauline. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, good morning to all. So indeed, um, in terms of where we are, there's a very important date coming up with the 22nd and 23rd of March. Um, this is the next European Council. Um, so all heads of government and um, uh, state of the various 27 member states uh, will meet um, in order to discuss a number of topics, but uh, among these Brexit, and the aim is very much for them to adopt a set of EU guidelines on the future relationship. So this is going to be the negotiating mandate for Michel Barnier to start um, the scoping exercise on the future relationship. Uh, meanwhile, talks on transition and the withdrawal agreement are still ongoing. Uh, although a milestone was reached in December in terms of progress on citizens' rights, for instance, um, or Ireland, um, the goal now is really to translate all of these political agreements into something legally binding, um, an actual withdrawal treaty that would have to be ratified by both the UK Parliament, uh, the European Parliament, uh, the EU27, as well as the UK government. Um, there are also, you will remember, a series of workshops, um, internal workshops organised by the task force of Michel Barnier, uh, for representatives of the various member states. Um, they are also involving, of course, the European Parliament, but not uh, stakeholders or industry, as you might appreciate. But the slides are published, and uh, we usually share these in our weekly uh, Brexit Digest, where, which goes on, on Mondays. Um, so these workshops are continuing uh, in order to help the 27 really understand the implications of Brexit and try to form a position as to where they'd like to go um, in various areas. Uh, the formal talks on the future relationship could start in spring, um, possibly as soon as April or May, uh, but that's very much Irish border issues allowing. Uh, Donald Tusk, who is the president of the European Council, was very clear uh, last week that the Irish border issue has to be sorted out first. Um, and they need to see 
at least sufficient progress there and something sufficiently tangible, credible and acceptable for both sides uh, to be able to move on uh, to the wider discussions on the future relationship. So because of this uh, and because of some disagreements we've seen, um, this is still a very mobile um, and changing discussion. Uh, things to change from one day to the next at the moment uh, before this, this council. And the prospect of no deal, I'm sorry to say, remains very much on the table. Uh, clearly, it's not something we'd like to see. We're very much hoping that at least there will be an agreement on a transition or implementation phase. But at this point in time, um, it's not the case yet. This is all still being discussed. Um, on the next slide, I will provide you with an update on the state of play of negotiations. So as you can, you can see, um, I've amended some of these points to say ongoing. So right now, uh, discussions are going on in parallel on the withdrawal arrangements, as well as transitional measures. And to give you an idea of why, you know, I'm, I'm saying that everything is changing in this fast moving environment. Uh, in the past, both camps used to meet every three weeks on average uh, for a few days of negotiations. Now it's practically constant. They meet every single week and they are even going to meet over the weekend. Um, so the discussions on the withdrawal topics is not completed yet. Uh, negotiations at working level, so very much technical level, are taking place um, pretty much constantly, as I said, uh, on the agenda this week where the financial settlement, EU and UK citizens' rights, as well as other withdrawal topics, um, so touching upon things like procurement, customs for goods in transit at the time of Brexit, um, what happens in terms of right to be on the market for, for goods, uh, and so on and so on. And of course, the Irish border is very much uh, at the center of discussions still. Um, a draft withdrawal treaty was published by the European Commission a few uh, days ago. I will come back to that later. Um, but it's important to remember that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed uh, as part of that, including the possibility of a transition implementation phase, at least uh, until December 2020. Um, questions on transition measures or what the UK government calls an implementation phase are ongoing in parallel. Uh, we see growing convergence, but of course we'll only be able to provide you with more certainty um, once the um, uh, council has taken place and we'll then have a little bit more clarity as to where things um, are going. Um, this summit is going to be really critical uh, because also of the new guidelines on the future relationship. Um, but of course, whether discussions can move on to the future relationship depends very much on progress with the Irish borders issues and the withdrawal agreement. And I'd like to say that transition is not a certainty um, at this point. So in terms of the draft withdrawal agreement itself, um, as I said, the negotiations on these uh, withdrawal topics are still very much ongoing. Um, at the end of February, the task force of Michel Barnier released the first draft version of the withdrawal agreement. This is the legal product that will have to be agreed before Brexit and that will hopefully ensure that there is a transition period and that the rights of EU and UK citizens are guaranteed, among other things. Um, it's going to take the shape of a treaty. It will need to be ratified, as I said, by both the UK and the EU27 side, including the UK and European parliaments. Uh, before Brexit Day. Uh, this is the only way for a transition implementation period to be agreed. Um, and this is also um, the only legal certainty that we'll really, you know, that we'll get beyond political agreements uh, and promises. Um, the draft ritual agreement aimed to translate into a legal text the political agreement that was reached in December on EU and UK citizens, the financial contribution as well as Ireland. Um, it also contained provisions for transition and implementation period until the end of December 2020, as well as several new articles related to topics that have not yet or had not yet been discussed with the UK, um, such as custom formalities and rules for goods in transit uh, at the time of Brexit. So it, I think it's important Okay, we, 
that's being transported. Um, the um, uh, agreement uh, is on the European Commission's website, and if you want more information about the details, I'll kindly refer you to um, uh, the digest that we sent. Um, it's fair to say at this point that uh, the agreement is subject to change. For instance, the bids on the Irish border proposal were rejected by uh, the UK Prime Minister because she felt that this would basically put the border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Um, and it's also um, quite important to see that there are still disagreements on the transition um, and various elements uh, that have not yet been discussed. Um, we have quite a few questions and open points, such as what happens in terms of the qualifications of drivers, for instance, uh, which is not really clarified by the draft. Um, but all in all, I would say that Ireland is really going to be the biggest pending issue. So, of course, as soon as the text is a bit more stable, we'll update you in more details. Um, the other key development, and that's on the next slide, um, is the draft guidelines on the future relationship. Um, so these, these were published on the 7th of March. Uh, Donald Tusk, president of the European Council, sent to the EU27 member states a draft. This draft is being revised on a daily basis, um, and the idea is that it will be adopted uh, next week at the EU summit. Uh, still very much subject to changes, as I said, but um, in terms of the um, content and sort of top line things that will not change, it's very much going for a free trade agreement between the UK and the EU, uh, with some additional areas for cooperation, for instance, on transport. Um, aviation was very much mentioned in the, in the first draft uh, that was published last week. Um, and the idea uh, was to uh, find some, some good solutions um, for aviation with an air transport agreement combined with an aviation safety agreement, which would basically answer connectivity between the UK and the EU after Brexit. Um, but we also have now informal indication that the need for a road transport agreement um, has also been recognized and inserted in the latest version. So again, we'll be able to confirm that um, probably shortly before the summit and definitely after the summit. Um, the idea is that such free trade agreements would cover trading goods and provide zero tariffs in all sectors and no quantitative uh, restrictions, so no quotas. However, um, this is not a proposal for no non-tariff barriers. So for instance, uh, UK and EU companies would need to comply uh, with fairly cumbersome rules of origin in order to benefit from preferential access terms. Um, and in customs terms, the idea is still very much that declarations uh, would be needed because, of course, the UK uh, does not want to be in the or a customs union uh, with the UN for Brexit. Um, trading services um, would be covered, but mainly to, for instance, give the rights for uh, companies to establish uh, in, the, in the EU when they are UK companies and, and vice versa. Um, there's also a framework uh, for the recognition of professional qualifications, which is foreseen. This is an area, of course, of particular interest in the transport sector, uh, not least for um, ensuring recognition of driver CPCs. Um, but there's not enough concrete details at this time to be able to tell you definitely, yes, this will be, um, this will be solved. Um, the guidelines also cover customs cooperation mechanisms, but as I said, that do not replace the need for customs declarations or indeed customs checks. Um, and they also contain a framework for voluntary regulatory cooperation, uh, for instance, regarding sanitary and phytosanitary standards. But again, it remains to be seen how uh, easily this will be implemented and whether it will lead in no checks at the borders. Um, from what we understand at this stage, this is not this is not going to be the case. So this is still very much in a in a state of of flux, uh, of course. And um, I want to manage everyone's expectations and say that all we'll have anyway before Brexit, in terms of the future relationship, um, is a non-binding agreement that will be attached to the withdrawal treaty.
So this is only going to lead to a free trade agreement with cooperation on transport um, after, after Brexit. So in terms of the other latest developments from the EU27 side, on the next slide, um, there have been more EU notes to industry on the impact of no deal, uh, for instance, on subjects such as e-commerce, rail, uh, maritime transport. Uh, again, we strive to share more information with you through the, the, the regular digest that we publish. Uh, so if you're interested, please uh, drop me an email and you'll see my email address later. Um, there was also an internal workshop on transport, where road transport, maritime transport, um, as well as rail transport were, were discussed. Uh, so the Commission presented basically all the options, uh, the default situation, if there is no deal, um, and so on. And uh, it basically corroborated what FTA had been saying uh, about road transport, especially that there would be um, no liberalized arrangements in the event of no deal, and that unless there is an agreement that solves this issue, uh, we could end up with a very, very limited set of uh, what is called ECMT permits, uh, system under OECD, which would cover uh, less than 3% of the needs. Um, so hopefully this has been a bit of a wake up call for member states, this together with our uh, effort, our collective efforts, of course, um, and so hopefully uh, is something that will be tackled in the, in the guidelines on the future relationship. Um, and as I mentioned, of course, the other two important products were the draft withdrawal agreement and the draft guidelines on the future relationship. So to sum it up, um, what to expect and, and when. Um, the withdrawal agreement, uh, which was just a political agreement non-binding, so that was in December. Now, the task is to translate that into a legally binding agreement that could be ratified before March uh, 2019. Um, that would come with an annex, a political agreement on the framework for the future relationship, uh, which will very much contain the kind of elements I talked about uh, a while back. Uh, we'll have more clarity on that after the EU Council of next week. Then there could be hopefully a transitional or implementation period uh, from 2019 until uh, probably the end of uh, 2020, uh, because this is the deadline set by the EU side. Um, but that very much depends on whether the original agreement can be ratified. And after that, hopefully a new comprehensive UK EU free trade agreement with related arrangements um, in other fields, such as transport, for instance. So I'm now going to give the uh, floor back to, to Chris Welsh to tell you more about um, developments in the UK, as well as FT activities and what we're going to do next. Thank you very much, um, uh, Pauline. So yes, I'll now cover off some of the um, UK parliamentary um, activity. And in that regard, probably the most important um, matter has, has been the government has now published um, uh, the uh, haulage uh, bill. Um, and as by way of a bit of background to that, FTA has been working behind the scenes to ensure that um, uh, the freight and logistics industry's um, uh, views um, uh, have been put forward to try and influence uh, the shaping of the bill and how we deal with it uh, uh, subsequently. So um, uh, when it comes to the problem over haulage permits and trailer registration um, uh, ar ar arrangements, um, the FTA has met with the Labour Deputy Leader Lord Bassam in the House of Lords to brief him um, on, on the bill and the kind of problems and concerns that we have to, to get uh, broad uh, support in the Lords for um, our, our views on that. Um, and uh, FTA will be provided uh, with further opportunity to uh, uh, support uh, his, uh, his speech and uh, uh, the uh, technical detail um, in tabling potential um, amendments to that uh, uh, bill. Um, so um, more broadly, we've been uh, in regular contact uh, with, the, uh, with the opposition um, as the bill passes through um, both the House of Lords, but um, uh, uh, more importantly, the, um, uh, 
the arrangements that uh, take place um, in pollen or generally um, going um, through the uh, uh, through through pollen in more, in more detail. Um, so um, uh, you know where we stand on on, on, on permits. This is clearly a a, a really um, big issue for FTA and its uh, mem members, um, uh, and it's very much really dependent on the best possible outcome that we're looking for from the government uh, more broadly. And, th and that is that um, we're hoping clearly that within either um, a free trade agreement or a separate. Um, uh, standalone agreement on transport um, uh, as part of the broader government negotiations with the EU um, to negotiate a, a broader tran uh, transit arrangement which does not impose permits um, uh, at all so that we have open access um, um, for um, the freight um, industry uh, but we recognize that, uh, uh, that that's going to be a tough and difficult negotiation and therefore we must be ready for the potential um, issue of, 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 of permits. What we want to avoid um, is falling back on the the old ECMT permit arrangement, which was conducted under the auspices of the OECD in the days where the um, haulage markets were uh, clearly restricted by the issuing of, 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 of permits to um, um, uh, ECMT uh, members countries. Um, so we want to avoid a system where there's not enough permits um, in, in the system, uh, where there are clear restrictions uh, potentially imposed, and then you get into a very difficult uh, situation in terms of how permits will be distributed and uh, attributed, uh, uh, and uh, almost you know potentially in, uh, moving towards a sort of a, a, a system where uh, permits are um, um, uh, quote we have there's a quota and and, 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 that, and, that, and that kind of thing so um, uh, uh, there is a possibility if um, of a standalone uh, road transport agreement uh, and and if that happens uh, irrespective of um, uh, whatever system is is in place what we're really pressing for is is mutual recognition of operator licensing arrangements between uh, uh, countries um, uh, trading with the UK, uh, and um, and and ultimately within a permit system, if if that is what comes into place, we have unlimited number of permits which uh, get around the problem of, of, of uh, some form of rationing system. Um, um, so um, that's um, uh, w you know where we are with permits, and as you can see from the slide, we're over the next few days, um, uh, next week, coming up with the uh, the committee stage in the House of Lords, uh, which um, which will start that uh, discussion. And uh, and as I said, we have briefed um, uh, heavily um, on that in advance of that um, committee stage uh, uh, dis dis discussion. Um, in, in terms of um, other activities that are taking place in Parliament, the EU withdrawal bill. Um, will um, come up uh, in the House of Lords um, started yesterday, but um, uh, we're keeping a close monitoring of, 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 of that and further progress on, on, on the withdrawal bill will be regularly updated in our um, uh, weekly e-news, uh, Brexit e-news briefing um, and via our webinars um, and other FTA uh, uh, community communications. Um, so we're heavily monitoring that. Um, the the other um, uh, key bill is the trade bill. Um, at the moment, this is in the report stage in the House of Commons, uh, and that's still to be announced as to when um, um, that will um, uh, come forward. Again, um, FTA is closely monitoring this uh, and will be providing parliamentary uh, briefings uh, when when they are required. Um, now the shape of the bill, it's this is um, uh, the trade bill is likely to deal with the negotiations uh, with other countries, and of course our uh, our trade relationship with the uh, with, with the EU, and this all figures around whether there's going to be a uh, a, a really positive uh, UK EU trade deal. That's what the U UK government is is. Is, is, is hoping for, but as Pauline indicated earlier, it's all sort of subject to the wider agreements um, that uh, will be necessary in order to make progress 
um, or on those issues around uh, an implementation uh, uh, sort of uh, phase. So next slide, um, um, just to remind um, everyone that um, there are um, zero changes as far as Brexit is concerned at the moment. We are we are still a member of the EU, so uh, the permit system I talked about, the uh, uh, potential problems at borders if we don't get an agreement, the customs arrangements, um, you know, all at the moment are um, uh, some way off um, um, in, 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 until agreement um, is, is, is reached on those matters. So all the same EU rules apply, that's the EU driver's hours rules, uh, uh, um, working time um, arrangements, the penalty systems in place, um, all in place until um, the 30th of March uh, 2019, um, uh, plus, of course, any transitional arrangements that are in place that will enable us to tr keep trading as if we were in uh, the European Union until some formal settlement on our future trading relationship with Europe is, 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 is agreed. So now is the time to assess the impact uh, um, on, on, on your operations and, and to prepare the contingency uh, plans uh, for that. And that's been part of the process that we have been going through with members and subject of these, um, the, these um, arrangements as, as we go forward. So um, if we move on to the next slide in terms of FTA's Keep um, Britain Trading um, uh, Agenda, um, the, these are the things that we are pressing government um, to um, uh, take into account in, um, in the discussions. Um, and, and, and the most important thing um, has, has, is clearly urgent uh, confirmation of the terms and length of the transition uh, period and the implementation um, arrangements are, uh, around that. We and other industry organisations have stressed the the real importance of this to enable industry uh, and our members to be able to prepare for any new arrangements that, 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 that come into, in, in, into place. At the last FTA Council meeting, uh, members adopted uh, an agenda to keep Britain trading. Uh, this agenda takes into account the red lines from the UK government, including the fact that the UK will leave the customs union and single market. And it is focused on um, a number of core key things, which include um, the need uh, to preserve fluidity at the borders. So um, the, the frictionless trade is, 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 is frictionless trade is, is, is critical to us. What is needed is to provide clarity to, uh, to businesses and to help them prepare themselves especially um, shippers, uh, the cargo owners, uh, because they are the ones that have, um, that have got to comply with uh, new tariff arrangements, uh, uh, classification of, of, of goods, the amount of duties and taxes to be paid, um, and, um, and to make import and export declarations, which previously for EU trade they haven't been able to make. Uh, to, uh, to make. So those are the sort of planning arrangements which will be quite critical for, for starting the uh, uh, assessment of, um, of uh, contingency planning arrangements the companies need to make, but also the kind of uh, resources that will be needed to, to be able to do that. So um, it's also important that uh, to ensure that operators continue to operate and do deliveries across uh, 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 borders, otherwise trade just grinds to a, to a halt. And um, more importantly, um, to protect the ability for the logistics sector to be able to access uh, the workers that it needs um, um, uh, going forward. The transport industry um, and the logistics sector um, is, um, employ significant numbers of workers from the uh, EU. So clarity must be given in terms of how we can preserve those arrangements to ensure um, that we've got the people that can actually continue to um, uh, do the work that the uh, freight and logistics industry uh, needs. So some things we're, we're clearly doing there is getting urgent clarification from, uh, from the UK about um, what customs clarification arrangements we're going to um, put in, put in, put in uh, place. 
um, are we going to continue with the EU based um, clarification arrangements down to that level or are we going to move towards um, a simpler uh, or a different uh, not such a high level of classification perhaps that that the that will be demanded under WTO and, uh, 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 arrangements so um, moving on to the um, the next slide um, other key things include the um, uh, the conformity with um, um, uh, sanitary and physiosanitary checks and and uh, at, the, at the point of production rather than at the border where we do not want um, uh, additional uh, burdens uh, which would um, make delays um, inevitable at both Calais and 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 and, and Dover. Um, we continue to require unrestricted numbers of vehicles uh, able to cross um, the UK and EU borders. And as I said earlier, continued recognition uh, of not only operator licenses, but also driver licenses and, and, um, and driver qualifications such as the driver CPC and continued access to EU logistics workers employed in the UK on a seasonal uh, 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 basis. So moving on um, as swiftly as we um, um, uh, come towards the end of this uh, uh, webinar, um, following the UK Council meeting where members identified eight specific asks of, 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 of government, which included the urgent confirmation of terms and duration of any transitional implementation period, the requirement for frictionless trading arrangements during the transition period, uh, continued access for UK governments to benefit of EU agreements with third countries throughout the transition agreement, clarification of, on a custom system, duty rates, VAT and so on, um, unrestricted uh, numbers of vehicles to be able to cross the uh, EU uh, UK uh, border. This was just some of the points that um, uh, David Wells, our chief executive, after that meeting, wrote to the Prime Minister to um, state were absolutely critical from our industry point of view. Um, I'm pleased to say that, um, that Prime Minister took note of that and David Wells was um, invited to Downing Street to a Downing Street meeting uh, where FTA was invited to uh, meet the Prime Minister and, and, and the uh, business engagement lead uh, within number 10. Um, so that was a, 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 a real big opportunity for the logistics industry to be able to set out uh, its concerns, its solutions that we've put forward um, by, by government. Clearly, um, the whole issue of, of um, permits was, was and trader recognition and driver qualifications loomed very, very large on that to um, ensure that trade can continue uh, in, a friction, in a frictionless way. So um, next slide, um, the uh, other areas of political engagement on a high level basis um, have been how FTA is engaging with Parliament. Um, and last week, FTA took part in a round table with the Department of Transport on the haulage bill. Um, further round tables we organised throughout the country um, in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland and FTA uh, staff in the regions will be involved on, on, on that basis. We've been making FTA's position clear on permits and the kind of uh, preferred liberalisation agreement based on mutual recognition of driver licensing arrangements. And all these points were made at the Treasury uh, uh, Select Committee hearing last week by our president, Lee, Lee uh, Pomlet. Um, so FTA is doing all that it can to ensure that um, government and parliament is aware of the implications of Brexit and what our solutions are to ensure that our members can conduct their affairs at, um, at the appropriate level. And finally, um, uh, uh, that engagement is being taken across uh, the channel to, uh, uh, to Brussels uh, and, and the political engagement um, with the uh, EU. Last week, um, FTA held a uh, an event in the European Parliament, um, which was attended by uh, over 100 uh, attendees, um, including MEPs, the European Commission, national government uh, uh, representatives, hosted by um, 
the um, uh, the European Parliament uh, officials, um, Wim de Camp, um, and that was a big success in, in, involving um, um, FTA Port of Dover and Port of Calais to be able to go through some of the really practical things that need to be done to ensure trade. Con, uh, continues, and I think the big message that came through from that uh, uh, event was, uh, you know, the the commonality of position between the Port of Dover and and, and, and Calais. Um, in, you know, this is a common understanding about with those ports about how we need to help manage this. So it's not a question of Dover wanting something. Cali wanting something else. There's genuine common agreement between those ports in terms of how we need to uh, to move forward on 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 on, on that on that basis. Um, so um, that's quite critical, clearly, because um, uh, at some stage the European Parliament will have to agree any agreement that um, is is potentially agreed between the UK and the uh, and the uh, and the European Union. Uh, and the, the fact that we had uh, distinguished people from the European Parliament, uh, from industry, um, member states, uh, representatives, and important commission departments that will be responsible for this in the future, like uh, um, the uh, DG responsible for uh, tax affairs, VAT, and so on, uh, being present, um, including representatives from the Barnier task force being there um, meant that we were really able to engage in the right way um, on behalf of members and for the UK logistics um, in, in, in industry. So um, we, through our Brussels office, had further engagement, um, not only with Barnier task force, but, not, but with other activities. And last week we um, were able, uh, with representatives of the Barnier Task Force, to engage with uh, uh, various other uh, departments in um, in the in the Commission on the road haulage uh, uh, issues. Um, and in addition to that, um, FTA Ireland um, has been involved in Brexit meetings with the cabinets of Commissioners Bulk, which is Transport and the Commissioner for Agriculture, Hogan, um, uh, to ensure that the border issues in Ireland and the land bridge issues uh, um, for Irish trade coming through Britain are, you know, well, underst well understood. So I hope members can see that as we come to the end of this seminar, FTA is literally pulling out all the stops to ensure that we engage um, not only in the UK, but um, with uh, our colleagues in Europe to understand the consequences for Brexit and what we're seeking on, 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 on your behalf. So in, in closing down the seminar now, just coming up to further FTA events and activities to keep you up to speed with what is going on. Um, Pauline referred earlier to now the weekly uh, Brexit um, uh, briefing that goes out. Um, if you're not listed for that, then um, you can see on uh, Pauline's uh, email address on the slide, take a note of that and contact her and get on that list and that will um, bring you up to speed weekly with some of these developments that I've been talking about uh, and reporting to you today. And um, Transport Manager starts um, its, 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 its round of events and we have in Ireland we have Transport Manager um, session there which will obviously focus on the, um, the, the Irish border issues and uh, Irish uh, um, land border issues through uh, through the UK, um, and uh, uh, if you have operations in Ireland um, or in any way affected by that, then um, again um, go on to our website and the FTA uh, Ireland website and um, get yourself booked on that if, um, if, if if that's of importance to you. We have our next uh, Brexit webinar on the nineteenth of April. Uh, so make a note of that in your diary at the same time, 11, 11.30. Um, for those of you that attend the multimodal show, um, this is one of the biggest uh, multimodal shows with um, over 4,000 uh, shippers in particular attending this um, event. 
and we have um, the FTA seminar day um, there, and we have four key seminars, and we will be giving a broader uh, roundup of, um, of of where we are with Brexit with a, a particular seminar uh, at the show. So if you're at Mojo uh, participating in Mojo Mode, we're going to be there. A drop along and meet us um, both at the seminar and on our stand. And the next big major event, um, which we are replicating and updating from last year, last March, we ran the first Keep Britain Trading Conference, which was a, a, um, a huge success with well over 160 uh, people um, attending, delegates attending. And we're replicating that um, in June with a date uh, to be um, advised. Um, uh, so keep in touch with us um, over over that. So still still plenty um, more events to keep you up to speed with what is um, going on. So at that point, I'd like to conclude the webinar. Um, I would like all of you like to thank all of you for uh, attending this uh, webinar, and uh, keep in touch with us, and uh, we will be sending out further details of the the title for the next event uh, webinar event and. Um, and the FTA communications will provide further details about the events I just referred to. So thank you uh, for, for your attendance at today's meeting. I'd like to close it now. Thank you.